fact that we have for more than 402 years not dealt with the issue of race. The concept of race originally came to our shores as a way of legitimating the taking of land from people and the taking of people from land. It is a systematic way of disenfranchising some, literally taking away their rights, their privileges, their access to power, and then giving advantage to others. In essence, race is a means of controlling who gains access to wealth, power, and privilege in a society. A race originally was used to legitimate manifest destiny, the taking of the land from the indigenous American population, and was also used to legitimate the uh, formation of the enslavement of African people in this country. Why was it that it was justified? It provided a hierarchy of humanity that suggested that those who were subject to have their land stolen, those who were subject to be kidnapped and taken and their labor taken from them were lesser human beings, were less worthy of value, were able to be turned into commodities, were able to be used for the, prof the profits uh, of others. The unfortunate thing in our country is that we recognize the problematic nature of such things as manifest destiny. We recognize the problematic nature of slavery. We ended slavery in uh, 1865, yet we kept the concept of race. In the aftermath of that, it gave us a uh, Jim Crow, uh, separate but equal, a different way of looking at humanity. We ended Jim Crow and separate but equal through the civil rights movement. Uh, Dr. William Barber might call it the second reconstruction, but we kept the concept of race and it gave us the war on drugs, which was, as we know, a war on black and brown people, and it gave us mass incarceration. We thought we finally moved behind, beyond that with the election of President Barack Obama. We uh, thought that we were moving to a quote unquote post-racial society, yet we kept the concept of race intact and it continues to give birth to other forms of oppression, making America great again, I think I heard someone say. All of this to say is that we've got to deal with race. We've got to finally confront this unfortunate social construct. We've got to find a way to find each other as human beings again uh, in equal ways uh, that can support all people. Different fields have chosen different ways to address the way that the concept of race has worked. Uh, in my field, I'm a, a professor of Hebrew Bible. We have developed something called African-American biblical hermeneutics, which is a way of utilizing our own traditions to understand scriptures in ways that validate black and brown folks. Within the legal system, they developed something called critical race theory. Now, this has been a idea that has been demonized, that's been villainized in our contemporary context in ways that have made us often cringe when we hear the term. But why is that? Whose purpose is this serving? How do we move beyond this to utilize this effective tool from the legal community looking at policy decisions to begin to confront systemic racism? Well, I wish I could answer those questions, but frankly speaking, those questions are above my pay grade. As a good friend of mine likes to remind me, I am not a lawyer and I need to uh, let the lawyers have conversations like this. So tonight I'm pleased to introduce our two guests to you, a guest who can help us get to the bottom of critical race theory and notions of systemic racism. Uh, attorney Gita Kapoor and Ms. Christian Nunez, the president of the National Organization of Women. Let me just introduce these two women to you. Gita Kapoor is a proud native of Nakuru, Kenya. After graduating from Keenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Kapoor uh, pursued a calling to study law. She earned her Juris Doctorate degree from the School of Law at UNC Chapel Hill in 2003. From her work at the Center of, for Death Penalty Litigation to an Assistant Public Defender in Orange County, 
to private practice in Durham. She has devoted her entire career, almost 20 years, to representing poor and racial minorities. Attorney Kapoor was the first woman of color to earn the distinction of being a board certified specialist in criminal law, juvenile delinquency. She has uh, argued several landmark constitutional Supreme Court cases here in the state of North Carolina. She's currently as a case pending before the North Carolina Supreme Court where prosecution uh, struck a juror because she, a prosecutor struck a juror because she participated in the Black Lives Matter movement. This case raises an issue of enormous magnitude in the current racial climate. The Marshall Law Project and the American Civil Liberties Union will uh, have submitted a brief to support Kapoor's argument that this type of racial discrimination is barred by the US Constitution. In addition, and let me say that this is how I got to know Attorney Kapoor, she's been one of the lead pro bono lawyers for the North Carolina NAACP's Moral Monday protests. Her high profile trial of protesters who were uh, a lawyer and a doctor led to a ruling that uh, the, building, the building rules of the state of North Carolina legislature violated the First Amendment. Subsequently, the Speaker of the House convened the Rules Committee for the first time in several decades to rewrite the building rules. Actually, I think I was part of that case. Reverend Dr. William Barber II awarded her the NAACP's Humanitarian of the Year Award. Attorney Kapoor has also provided written and oral testimony before the United States Congress on mass incarceration and the school to prison pipeline. Realizing that systemic change could not come in the court, uh, courtroom alone, Attorney Kapoor took her passion to the classroom. She teaches one of the few courses in the nation on critical race theory and mass incarceration. She's also taught as an adjunct professor of law at the University of North Carolina and at Campbell Law School in Raleigh, North Carolina. She has served on the boards of numerous nonprofit organizations, such as the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, the North Carolina Advocates for Social Justice, and the North Carolina School of Law Alumni Board of Directors. Attorney Kapoor was recently recognized by the National Trial Lawyers as one of the top 100 criminal defense trial lawyers in North Carolina. She also is the proud mother of a three-year-old, is she now three? A three-year-old baby, uh, Zara, who can't be here tonight or she might make a little bit of noise. Speaking with her and engaging in conversation tonight is we don't have, we didn't just go out and find someone uh, average. We have uh, Christian Nunez, the president and national organi uh, of the National Organization of Women. Christian Nunez uh, is, has an MBA, an MS, and an LCSW. She became the president of NOW in August of 2020. She was previously appointed the vice president by the board in May of 2019. As the second African-American president in the organization's history, Nunez is leading the organization through an intersectional lens, bringing a diverse coalition of grassroots activists to work against structural sexism and racism. She's a former NOW board member and a committee chair, as well as a licensed clinical social worker, a consultant, and a woman minority business owner. Christian is an active community organizer and public speaker, regularly being featured at events such as the March for Black Women, the Women's March events, and rallies around the country. Christian has lost, launched key initiatives at NOW, such as the Unlock the Future campaign, which demands humane treatment for detained immigrant families, NOW's Racial Justice Summit, and the Feminist Agenda campaign in partnership with Black Women's Blueprint. Christian is the founder of a behavioral health and consulting practice, as an advocate for social justice and mental health policy, she took up the role as chair of the Mayor's Commission on Disability Issues. She is often featured in media outlets, including MSNBC, Business Insider, Prism, Politico, The Huffington Post, Ebony, Black Enterprise Magazine, Yahoo News, and many other national and local outlets. She received her bachelor's degree in social work from Northern Arizona University her master's uh, of uh, science degree from Columbia University and her master's of business administration from the University of Phoenix. Christian, I'm so pleased to turn this conversation 
over to you now. I look forward to hearing what you have to ask Attorney Kapoor. God bless. Thank you so much, Reverend Sattler. Uh, this is a pleasure to be here this evening. I want to thank everyone, welcome all of the participants um, and good evening. This is going to be an excellent conversation tonight and I'm excited to be here with uh, civil rights attorney and author Gita Kapoor and to have a great discussion about her book, To Drink from the Well, The Struggle for Racial Equity at the Nation's Old Public University. So tonight we are here to talk about her critically acclaimed book. And while we examine institutional racism, critical race theory, and our quest for racial justice in the United States of America, while we navigate through our own design systems of oppression. And I'm excited to begin this discussion. Before I do, I think it's so important to have a context to this conversation. We know that the discussion about critical race theory is such a controversial discussion. But it's important that we understand a little bit about, I think, the, the context of Gita's book and why this conversation is so important and how it's so relevant to what we're experiencing today um, in this current landscape and in our educational landscape, our political landscape, and just our social landscape. So I want to read a little bit um, from her book from chapter three, page 73. For those who haven't read the book, I encourage you to pick it up. Um, it's a great book. But what this book is talking about, it's, it's going over a visit and it's from, it's going over uh, the book about University of North Carolina. And in this book, I'm gonna read a short excerpt. Um, it's a visit from um, the poet Langston Hughes when he was visiting um, there to really discuss and read a poem called Christ in Alabama, which is what is what's addressing the Scottsboro case, um, a controversial case about a rape of a woman um, by eight black men, allegedly. <clears throat> um, and so in this point, what happened was essentially, I'm gonna just read um, what happened was he came, he read his, his poem, and then there was a conversation that takes place afterward, um, after he had this conversation and read his poem um, between some uh, individuals at the, uh, the, at the, uh, the, the school on the campus. And they say that uh, before his university debut, Abernathy and Butita took Hughes to the fancy white only cafeteria in Chapel Hill. Three old black waiters kept refilling their glasses with iced tea. Hughes read his poems to excited crowd, packed the doors of Jared Hall, while police stood guard outside to prevent trouble. That night, he stayed with a leading black family in Chapel Hill. The next day, he visited Guy Johnson's sociology courses. Before the dust kicked up, Hughes to pardon Ford had settled. Controversy exploded. Black people in other North Carolina towns said that Hughes had walked into the lion's den and come out like Daniel, unscathed. David Clark, who still despised Graham's defense of the Gastonian mill workers, reprinted Christ in Alabama and Southern Gentlemen. White prostitutes reprinted Christ in Alabama and mill owners and Negroes in the Southern textiles as two examples of student journalism, misleading readers into thinking that Contempo was a student paper sponsored by the university. Hundreds of letters and phone calls from high and low places across the state flooded President Graham's office, demanding that he fire the faculty who had invited Hughes to the campus. I had never read anything any worse than those two articles that came out of the Contempo, wrote Kim, Kip Lewis, who president of the university's powerful alumni association, president of the Cotton Manufacturers Association of North Carolina, and secretary of treasurers, Duke Erwin Cotton Mills. It's enough to make the blood of every Southerner boil. Boys are often suspended for drunkenness, but I would be a thousand times rather for my son to occasionally be get drunk than to have propaganda such like the Contempo, which is striking at the very foundation of our civilization and our social relationships. Lewis was in coming university trustee in 1932. So that's just a little bit about uh, the visit from Langston Hughes. But essentially, he was discussing his poet about the alleged allegations and accusations of eight Black boys and Black men who were accused of um, raping uh, a white woman. And he was talking about the injustices that happened. 
I'm gonna quickly read from page, uh, chapter seven on page 165. And in this chapter, this is years later, um, quite a few years later when President Frank Porter Graham was running for, um, was bringing back another group in 1947 and they were a board of trustees meeting and they wanted to bring and take in a grant um, to consider a grant from Julius Rosenwald Foundation that they wanted to engage to really help their sociology program. But the board of trustees felt that the program had a racial allegation, which is basically unionizing the racists. And that would just, was horrible for the South. So from this excerpt, they're talking about it during their board of trustees meeting when they say, essentially, um, we hold our title of power by the tenure of service to God. And if we fail to administer equal and exact justice to Negroes whom we deprive of suffrage, we shall in the fullness of time lose power ourselves. For we must know that God who is love trusts no people with authority for purpose of enabling them to do injustice to the weak. And they, and it's really interesting because one of the things that was really interesting at this time was that there was a big, huge argument because they did not want um, they didn't want to racist to unionize in this time. And I'm reading this part because I think it's so important to talk about this conversation that we're having today. And so you know, I'm gonna bring this to you <laughs> because if throughout your book, it's so very important because this is so important to critical race theory because what we're seeing today is that we are having these conversations where we are dealing with the same thing that they were dealing with in 1932, what we're dealing with in 2021. So I wanna know from you, can you give us a conversation and you tell us why it's important that you wrote this book and also share with everybody why we're talking about critical race theory today. Sure, good evening, everybody. Thank you, President Nunes for um, being, the, um, being my discussion partner this evening. And I'd also like to thank Andrea Miller from the Center for Common Ground for um, her incredible work, as well as her team um, who put this event together and um, Joel Siegel. And I also wish to thank the audience for joining us tonight. It is very important for us at this moment in our nation's history to have a candid conversation about critical race theory. Critical race theory is an academic concept that was created by the late law professor Derek Bell and other progressive law professors in the 1980s. While I was in law school, I was trained in critical race theory by the late law professor John Calmore, who was also considered a leading scholar in the subject. In law school, law students are taught that the law is objective and neutral they're also taught that the law is colorblind and that legal institutions employ a rational and apolitical um, method in distributing social power. They're also taught that American institutions are racially and culturally neutral. However, the law has been used throughout American history as the primary tool to uphold white supremacy and establish hierarchies of gender, class, and sexual orientation. American history also shows that oppressed and marginalized groups have never passively accepted their treatment. They resisted and critical race theory is a part of that long tradition of resistance. We in America live with a myth. It is the myth that we are a merit-based society. Indeed, Dr. King said that America is not a society based upon merit. Um, we're all told that one can pull up, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but the reality is that some of us are not wearing boots. So why are jobs, wealth, education, and power distributed by race? 
Critical race theory is a legal analysis that identifies and critiques the causes of the inequalities. Its tenets are that race is not a biological classification, that race was invented. Indeed, science has revealed that 99.9% .9 of all of our DNA, everyone who's on the Zoom call tonight, we are 99.9% percent alike. Our DNA is 99.9% .9 alike. It's only a fraction of a percentage that determines skin color, which is the basis of race. And so it's not a biological construct. It's a social idea that has been used over time to uphold white supremacy and racism. The second tenet of critical race theory is that Racism is not just an individual bias or prejudice or an overt, overt act by an individual, but that racism is something that is embedded in laws, regulations, rules, procedures, and institutions that leads to different outcomes by race. Essentially, the second premise of critical race theory is that racism can exist without racists. That is an, uh, a very interesting point that you that you bring up, Gita, and that racism can exist without racism, and and it almost you know brings up the point of like a caste system, right? If we talk about a racialist caste system that is so embedded in our systems that it continues existing um, way after it was initially originated, um, and I think when we, when I read your book, I think your book clearly lays this out. I know that in September, we talk about critical race theory. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay sorry, I got muted. Um, and we know in September of 2020, one of the things that we know that happened was um, the former Donald, President Donald Trump had passed an executive order that essentially was excluding any diversity and inclusion trainings that they, they felt had divisive concepts, race or sex stereotyping, race or sex scapegoating, and um, critical race theory was considered a divisive uh, technique or concept because exactly what you're explaining was talking about these, um, these, different, these different concepts that explained history essentially. Um, and now there have been over 300 diversity and inclusion trainings that have been canceled because of this executive order. And we have seen it play out in our political and educational landscapes and even some of our government landscapes. Um, can you please tell us a little bit more about how this is continuing to affect us in our, in our daily lives and, and what, you know, and, and how your book talks about this and how you share how this, can, this will continue to affect us um, because of how it's been so deeply ingrained in our systems. Well, first, let me say this. Um, the, the term, the concept, the scholarship of critical race theory is being misused right now. Um, the real fear is not that a legal academic concept is going to be taught to our children in public schools. The fear is that American history, the truth, is going to be taught to our children. In effect, critical race theory is being misused. And it started this way. Um, after George Floyd was savagely murdered, America was forced to look at, look at itself in the mirror and face a truth that it had been in denial about, that it was still suffering from racism. There were mass protests across the nation, Fortune 500 companies even publicly denounced his murder and pledged themselves to racial diversity and inclusivity. Statements were made by institutions across the nation in my predominantly white neighborhood, Black Lives Matter signs were in the front yard of most houses. 
it seemed we were in a moment, a, a turning point moment in our nation's racial history. In fact, public school systems across the nation sought to implement um, the 1619 project curriculum that was created by uh, New York Times journalist, Nicole Hannah Jones. Its central premise is that the nation was not founded in 1776 when the Declaration of Independence was issued. Uh, Hannah Jones, the, the premise of the 1619 project um, by Nicole Hannah Jones is that the, this nation was founded in 1619 when 20 or 30 enslaved African people were dragged from a slave ship onto the shores of Jamestown. Well, again, we're in the wake of George Floyd, of all of us watching his savage murder. Donald Trump uh, called the 1619 Project critical race theory and said it was a crusade against American history, an ideological poison that will destroy our country. Now, it's very important to to note that when a president says something, people are going, American people are going to believe that it's the truth. So he's standing behind a platform that says president of the United States. And he says that the 1619 project is critical race theory. That is the moment where critical race theory began to be deployed as a tool, as a weapon to rally the right to rally the conservative base. In effect, Trump and conservatives stole the term critical race theory, lied about what it truly means, and as I said earlier, deployed it as a weapon, much like gun laws, um, to rally conservative voters to the midterm election. In fact, this year from May until August, um, the conservative Fox News Channel has mentioned critical race theory 1,300 times. And May to August are critical months because those are the months leading up to the midterm election. And suddenly, all of a sudden, um, new bills to ban critical race theory from being taught were introduced by Republican legislators across the country. As of August of this year, 27 states have introduced bills or instituted other measures that restrict how teachers can discuss racism, sexism, and American history, the truth. And, you know, I would like for the audience to know that these proposed measures to restrict critical race theory or to restrict teaching American history are not, are not limited to the South. Indeed, Iowa, right, if we think back to um, a moment in where we all had hope, Iowa was where a black man named Barack Obama, he won the caucus. Iowa has a critical race theory um, proposed measure. New Hampshire, Maine, New York, and my own state of North Carolina. Indeed, North Carolina's bill would have banned my book on the racial history of the University of North Carolina. Unfortunately, this um, misuse of terms and this misuse of, of terms is nothing new. Throughout history, when this nation has been prepared to deal with the issue of race in an effort to make equality a reality, and not just a promise written in the constitution, there's white backlash. Conservatives invent a crisis and give it a title that the average American person can understand. This time, the crisis is critical race theory. But what I would like for all of us and everybody who's watching this is to only use critical race theory in its proper context. Otherwise, we are participants in the lie. What they don't want being taught again to our children is the truth about how this nation was founded. Absolutely. 
I, you know, I, and that's a great point that you bring up. It's just that, you know, I think sometimes when we're addressing the reality of our truth, you know, that can be hard and it can be difficult to hear. And a lot of times, you know, we know that part of this, part of the strategy has been using fear. Um, and as you said, misuse of words and theory um, to to fear and to 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 provoke fear into people to get them to do the complete opposite, including some like-minded of uh, and some of our own to also buy into it. Um, and, and I think that we have to be very careful with that and how we've used misuse of the word. Um, and in question with our own selves, you know, and I think, you know, I know I was reading your book, I know that even in back, um, there was an example in the book when there was, you know, during Graham's private second primary, the, the no truth committee did a very similar thing when they had a flyer that was circulating to white people call wake up before it was too late. And they had questions such as, do you want? <laughs> and the questions were like, do you want? And they'd be like, Negroes working beside you, your wife and your children in the mills. You want Negroes eating beside you in public places as your foremen to your overseers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and, and this is very much fear-based and it's very much to confuse people to make them believe that this is where things will go if, you know, if they allow, you know, segregation, if they allow integration. And this is no different from what we're seeing happen today with how they're trying to use the terms or misuse the terms critical race theory by saying, if we have diversity and inclusion in schools, if we teach your children about race, if we have diversity and training in your places, then that means that we are saying you're all racist <laughs> or all white people are racist or things like that. Um, but can you talk to us a little bit more about how you feel that this misuse of uh, how this misuse is continuing to shape the racial injustice is that it's being experienced by persons of color um, and being experienced by individuals in, in, in our community? Well, I think um, I think I, I already answered that um, just in that critical race theory is being misused, it's being deployed by conservatives as a tool, um, as a tool to rally the conservative base. Um, and, you know, it's a lie. That's what it is in plain English. It's, it's, it is a lie. Um, and it, how it affects people of color is that the real history behind this nation, um, the reason that, one of the reasons why I wrote, the, wrote this book was to find, because I discovered the real history. They don't want that history being taught to our children. And the pretextual reason that they give is what you said, that um, all white people or, or that white children will feel guilty. Well, the, my, my response to that is that um, they should feel guilty. And history, the, the people who in our history oppressed African-American people, they should feel guilty. It's too late now to say that the truth should not be taught. The truth should not be revealed because someone is going to feel guilty. Maybe it's time for America to feel guilty so that we can make some racial progress. Also mentioned New York Times journalist Pulitzer winner Nicole Hannah Jones earlier, and you said that she was denied tenure at University of North Carolina uh, when she uh, had a national reputation for being the most progressive university um, at the South. <clears throat> so, were you surprised at all when this happened? When this occurred? No, I was not surprised at all. Ne the Nicole Hannah Jones tragedy is just another chapter in the university's dark history where it was pushed and forced by long struggle to make the moral decision. This cycle is repetitive in the university's history. I'll give you um, two examples. 
1983, the university acknowledged that there was a need for a Black cultural center, a freestanding Black cultural center. A, feasib a feasibility study was ordered by the trustees and the, um, the people that conducted the study said that the center would need 23,000 square feet. Well, the trustees did not approve of giving so much space to African-American people. So the idea um, was pushed um, into a back room for about five years. Afterward, the trustees shoved the Black Cultural Center into 900 square feet space in the student union. 900 square feet when the feasibility study that was done by a neutral party said that the, the center needed 23,000 square feet. This was done in large part because of um, a professor named Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone. Interestingly enough, Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone was an African-American woman, much like Nicole Hannah Jones, and was fighting the university to grant her tenure. In the process, she suffered an aneurysm and died in 1991, and her death became a catalyst for students to begin protesting for a freestanding building for the Black Cultural Center. In 1991, students began mounting pressure upon university officials through protests. What is key to note about these protests is that the students included football players who threatened not to play football. Well, that caught the attention of university officials. The protests made national news. Um, in in one of the one of the the most well covered protests, um, several students sat down on the floor of the chancellor's office and refused to leave. They were arrested. This crisis became national, much like the Nicole Hannah Jones crisis became national. It brought Reverend Jesse Jackson and Spike Lee to Chapel Hill. It's only after this national embarrassment, this national push, that in 1993, the Board of Trustees approved a freestanding Black Cultural Center, but told supporters they would have to raise all the money to build it on their own. It took them eight years. I don't know how they did it, but they raised over $9 million. 21 years after the struggle began, the Sonia Haynes Black Cultural Center opened. Much in the same way, there was controversy over the university's Confederate statue, Silent Sam. Now, I would pass by that statue quite often as an undergraduate. And the plaque on there says to our, to our boys who answered the most sublime call to duty. It's important to note that a lot of Confederate statues were, statues were erected um, in the early 1900s. Silent Sam was erected in 1913 at the university. Well, students had been protesting since 1965 during the civil rights era for the removal of Silent Sam. The university recently, the University Board of Governors made a backdoor deal with the Sons of the Confeder Confederacy, a, um, a proud, a publicly announced white supremacist group they make a deal with this white supremacist group for $2.5 million to take Silent Sam and for its upkeep. Well, this event made national news like the Nicole Hannah Jones controversy did. And the university, um, the university was condemned, embarrassed, and ashamed. Well, students faculty, prominent alumni protested to the court saying the backdoor deal damaged the university's liberal reputation and underscored its commitment to white supremacy when it should be working towards ending white supremacy. It's only after being nationally embarrassed that the moral decision is made. The settlement was voided and silent Sam was returned to the university. So the Nicole Hannah Jones tragedy is what I call it. Just another, another cycle in the university's history that is going to continue to repeat over and over again as long as the university does not 
as long as the university makes a choice not to address systemic racism, much in the same way that they're going to be other George Floyds, unless this nation faces and reckons with systemic racism. Your book opens powerfully with a narrative about an enslaved man of Wilson Caldwell. Please tell us how you found him and about how you recreated scenes of his enslavement. Sure. Um, after, after years and years of searching through archives and finding one story after another of racism at or by the University of North Carolina, I kept asking myself, when did this all begin? In fact, one of the stories that I found was the Langston Hughes story that you highlighted. Well, one day I stepped off the elevator on the third floor of the Wilson Library at the university, which is um, an enormous library that houses all the archival materials. I went there to continue looking through the archives um, and I opened the glass doors to enter. First thing I saw was a large grainy black and white headshot of a black man that was perched on a canvas stand. Andrea, can we show the um, can we show the fifth picture? That one. This is the, the photograph that I saw. The world around me stopped. I could not take my eyes off of him. Our eyes were locked in, in a stare. And I heard him say, tell my story, tell my story. I knew the moment I saw him that he was the beginning. Turned out his name was Wilson Swain Caldwell. He was a, a slave owned by the university's um, president. The librarians told me that he was buried at the university cemetery. I went to find his grave that day. Could we please show the next photograph? This is his grave in the university's cemetery in a small separate black section. Now it's important to know that even in death, enslaved people were oppressed. They're they are buried in a separate section that is markedly different than the white section. Well, I found this weathered gray sandstone shaft. It's about eight feet high. It's probably the only memorial of its kind in the state nation, some say even in the world, to an enslaved person. Inscribed on the, on the bottom there, is a, inscribed on the metal plate there at the bottom is a racist tribute to Wilson Caldwell. I'm just going to read part of it. Here was laid the body of Wilson Caldwell, the student's friend and servant, the best type of black man who he sought to elevate by labor, the solution of the race problem, mindful mainly of his duties, his rights were cheerfully conceded. Three generations of white men testified of his faithfulness. Let him rest here till he's ready for work again. Let him rest here till he's ready for work again. As I read those words, I thought to myself, even in death, he was to remain enslaved. Even in death, he could not be free. My heart filled with grief at that moment. I, I bursted into tears. I sat there on the ground that you can see with him quietly for a while. I wondered what his life was like. I wondered what deferred dreams he and his wife had for their 11 children and what deferred dreams they had for their own life. Then just before leaving, I made him a promise that he was the beginning of my, he would be the beginning of my book. If you could show the next photograph. This is the first photograph in my book. It's a photograph of him 
standing on the steps of Old East Dormitory, which is the first public state university building in the nation. The archives do not have the stories of enslaved people like Wilson Caldwell. So I stared at this photograph for a very long time and dug deep into my spirit. There I found the stories and I let them pour onto paper. Toni Morrison called this writing technique emotional memory. So that's how I recreated some of the scenes of enslaved people in my book. Thank you. Wow, that's 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 um, very touching um, and emotional to just uh, just hear the inscription on his uh, marker uh, alone. But uh, thank you for just being brave enough to take this journey, uh, with Gita, because this is so important. Um, what just starting here? What it also shares and talks about. It's just the history uh, that slavery played such a large role in, in the University of North Carolina's history. Um, and just reading your book, you know, it went from owning chattel slavery to renting slaves to hunting runaway slaves, you know, which is so disturbing. Do you know if University of Carolina has done any work for or sort of justice to correct this history? No, they have not. Andrea, you can um, you can take down the um, photographs. Thank you. No, they have not. In fact, what the university has done is denied the history, concealed the history, and scattered it across states, across the state of North Carolina. I had I spent eleven years working on this book, um, and it took me a very long time to put the university's history together. And I went there, I studied there for seven years. The fact of the matter is that the university denied and continues to deny its racial history. Um, so until it's ready to face the truth and have a reckoning, there's not going to be any restoration. Let's talk about, let's come now to full surface where we're at um, in 2021. On January 6th, we are all familiar with what occurred on January 6th, 2021. There was a domestic attack at the U.S. Capitol. How do you feel like what happened on January 6th, 2021 at the U.S. Capitol? How does that relate to what's, what you're discussing in your book? Well, Reverend Barber put it best in his forward to my book. He said this, white supremacy is maintained and reinforced by the stories we tell ourselves. Um, a journalist with the Atlantic Magazine said the same thing when he said, for some Americans, history is not the story of what actually happened. It's the story they want to believe. The terrorists who swarmed on the US Capitol on January 6th want to believe that Donald Trump won the 2020 presidential election. That's the story they're telling themselves in order to maintain white supremacy. Well, that is a lie. That is not the truth. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is the nation's oldest public university, has told the story that it is a progressive and an inclusive place. That is a lie. That is a myth. And as I said earlier, it's gone so far as to conceal and erase and deny its racist past. So January 6th and the national image that the university projects of itself show how white supremacy is maintained by the stories we tell ourselves. What my book does is my book reveal, re removes the veil of lies and reveals the truth. As we continue to go through what's happening right now this year, we also know that when we talk about unveiling and we talk about what um, has happened, we know that the white supremacy also talks about racism and sexism and how they both kind of intersect, right? 
And in the US Supreme Court recently examined a new law in Texas that would deny clinics. And, and so we're gonna go into reproductive justice a little bit and reproductive rights. Um, would deny clinics from providing abortion to women who are more than six weeks pregnant. And the high court also recently uh, heard arguments about the Mississippi uh, bans for abortions at 15 weeks. Um, Dobbs, <clears throat> the Dobbs case that we recently heard of December 1st. Um, and this has been um, a huge um, concern for the, the overturn of Roe um, and unconstitutional rights. But we also know that in this, that it truly affects and disproportionately affects you know, um, marginalized women, women of color, um, disabled women, um, women in poverty. And so we're also once again seeing how it's targeting certain groups of women and how that is deeply ingrained in our institutions and systems as well. So can you talk to me a, a little bit and even talk about maybe how this can relate to, um, and if possible, do you feel like this ban also relates on the teaching American history and how this ties into it as well. Yes, so the, the people who created the laws to restrict abortion are the same people who created the laws to restrict the teaching of American history. And they're the same people who have created the laws to suppress the black vote. In each case, there's a constitutional right that they're seeking to control. In teaching American history, it's the right of freedom of speech of the First Amendment. In banning abortion, it's the right of the woman to have autonomy over her own body without interference from the state. That originates from the 14th Amendment. In suppressing the black vote, it's the constitutional right to vote as set forth in the 14th Amendment. Well, freedom of speech, the right of women to make health decisions for themselves, and voting rights are all fundamental rights that have been recognized for a long time in our society. Because they're fundamental, they are unchallengeable rights under a democracy. Restricting or overturning these constitutional rights are steps toward making the United States an uh, authoritarian country. Authoritarian, sorry, I'm even having a hard time saying it. And furthermore, it's establishing a hierarchy with extremist white men at the top. Now, this is no different from the repressive regimes of Iraq, the Taliban, and of North Korea, countries that the United States should not be proud to be in the company of. We all need to wake up and fight back. And we cannot wait for the US Supreme Court to protect our constitution and to protect our democracy. Indeed, as you said, the court refused to block the Texas abortion law, which on its face clearly violates an established principle, an established ruling by the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade. The Texas abortion law violates Roe versus Wade, but the Supreme Court is unwilling to overturn it. In fact, in his dissent, Chief Justice Roberts, who is a Republican, warned that the clear purpose and actual effect of the law was to nullify this court's rulings. And Justice Sotomayor said that a majority of the justices have opt opted to bury their heads in the sand. So we cannot wait on the court. We have to fight back. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're also seeing this with the voter suppression laws as well, as you mentioned. And, you know, the Brennan Center mentioned that there are already 19 states who have enacted voter suppression laws, including your own state, North Carolina. And so, you know, clearly I, your book also examines this as well. And so tell us, can you give us some suggestions you have on how you feel that we should be fighting back? Could you share some of your own suggestions? Well, it's something simple, like every time you hear someone use the term critical race theory and they're not using it within a context that def implies or means that it's a legal academic concept and a legal form of scholarship, then we need to react and say, wait a minute, what do you mean by critical race theory? Quite often when people are asked, what do you mean by critical race theory? They don't really have an answer. 
the truth is that it's American history. So that's a small thing that we can do, right? Um, in terms of voter suppression laws, unfortunately, this is just history repeating itself. Here in North Carolina in 1898, um, the state had the largest number of black appointed and elected officials in the South. Extremist white men vowed to regain control over the state in the election. And once they did, they barred black people from voting unless they could read or write a portion of the North Carolina constitution. But white people who were illiterate, who could not read or write could vote if they could show someone in their ancestry had voted. We often call these grandfather clauses. Well, the voting restriction passed and the black vote was decimated. So, you know, and again, we cannot wait upon the US Supreme Court to protect the right to vote. We have got to organize ourselves. You know, the conservative people right now as we're having this discussion, they're organizing themselves for the next restriction that's going to be passed. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think that even this event tonight and how we all come together, you know, is a clear example of why it's so important for us to uh, work in coalition and partnership so that we can get organized um, and work to to be proactive and, and, and not wait until it's too late so that we can prevent these things from happening. And we also so, need to, we also need to make sure that we are, you know, educating ourselves and not relying on TV and social media to keep us informed absolutely. about what's going on. Absolutely, absolutely. I completely agree with you on educating ourselves thoroughly with the right education <laughs> and information. So Gita, I'm gonna give you, ask you one last question and then I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea who was going to take question and answers from our participants. This has been a great uh, discussion and conversation. Um, the book is great. I really enjoyed reading it myself. And I really encourage everyone to get a copy of it. I know we'll be um, giving away some uh, free random uh, giveaways. Um, and Andrew will tell you more about that. <laughs> um, so one of the important other things that, that your book discusses is the untold story and one of the most, um, most important civil rights cases of our time when it comes to education and that's the Brown versus Brown Board of Education case. Can you tell us a little bit about that discovery that you came across in your book? Well, um, without, without ruining the story in my book, um, I'll just, I'll give you a very brief answer. The untold story of Brown versus Board of Education is that it began and ended right here in North Carolina at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is the nation's oldest public university. <laughs> All right. Well, before I, I go and turn it over to Andrea, are there any last bits of information you would like to share with our participants, Gita, or anything that you would like to leave us with before we turn it over to the question and answer section? Well, you know, what I hope people take away from my book is that they, they get the sense that they are reading, they're not just reading history, they're reading what's going on today. And what I hope they also get from my book is the fact that there was resistance every, at every point by Af the African-American community and by people who consider themselves liberal or progressive. We have that same duty. Um, we owe that to our children. Absolutely. Well, I will tell you, it has been a pleasure having this dialogue and discussion with you. And I thank you for inviting me to uh, uh, moderate the conversation. And I'm going to turn it over to Andrea to take question and answers to the participants in the audience. Um, but I encourage everyone to get the book. Um, I think you will you're, be so um, eyes wide open <laughs> to what you learn, but it's relevant information that you need to learn. And I think it's important for us to all learn this history 
so that we can be educated and continue to figure out how we can work on correcting the system. Um, so I just want to pass it over to Andrea now. And thank you so much, Gita, for engaging in this conversation with me. And thank you, President Nunes, not just for tonight, but for all the work that you are you have done and are about to do to preserve the to preserve our democracy. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you both for an amazing conversation. Uh, one of the questions in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and answer. And the question is, how can I share this with some friends who are out of town and couldn't attend for some reason? Well, this event has been and is being recorded. And everyone who sent an RSVP, you will receive an email with the link to the recording because it will be on our YouTube channel. We had so many people ask that question saying we can't come. So that's why it's being recorded. It is also um, on our Center for Common Ground Facebook page. So that will be the raw recording. We will have our video editor correct any little things that we can correct. Um, one of the questions, Gita, that you answered early um, is, when did critical race theory begin to be taught in some law schools? So, you know, like I said, critical race theory was an, a legal concept that was developed um, by the late professor of Derrick Bell. It started being taught in law schools in the 1990s. In fact, if I can just have a moment, anyone who's, anyone who's interested in finding out more about critical race theory should read this book. Uh, critical race theory, the cave writings, and I can't read the rest. The key writings. Oh, I'm sorry. Critical race theory, the key writings that formed the movement. Excellent. Excellent. Um, all right. And then we have another question. Uh, they're, they're coming slow and on. No, they're not. Um, I'm going to need to have my team hop in and... Uh, help me curate that. Can you speak to the importance for African-Americans to tell our own story? That's the question. I was just, I was thinking of, of oh. my answer. Um, well, let me talk about my own experience. When I began this, um, this project. And actually, Andrea, can you show the first, the first, um, first photograph in the PowerPoint? All I right. I think this is important. I, I will. All right, let's see. Yep, I'm there. Got it, grabbed it. That one. Yep. So, I came across this photograph, which is a photograph of the of some of the first African American law students at the University of North Carolina. The caption underneath the photograph said that they were admitted after a lengthy court battle. And then I came across a second photograph at an exhibit. You could show the next one, please. This was the first three African-American undergraduates seated at the old well. The caption underneath the photo said that they were admitted after a lengthy court battle. Both of these cases went up to the US Supreme Court. Now, at the time that I saw these photographs, I had been, um, I had been away from law school for about seven years. I was stunned, I was speechless, I felt betrayed. I felt like history had been taken from me, and I think this gets to, to your question. Um, as I conducted my research, I started to find a much larger story. Um, one, one about the stark inequalities between the 
White Law School at the University of North Carolina and the Black Law School at the North Carolina College for Negroes. If you could show the, the next photograph. This is the library at the White Law School in, 19, in 1950 or so. If you could get to the next photograph. This is the library at the North Carolina College for Negroes. And there's a student trying to fish for a book. Now, these stories had never been told before. I went looking for books about the university's history. Every one of them, except for my book, was written by a white person. And every one of them glorified the university, talked about how Chapel Hill was a magical place. And it is, at some points, it is a magical place, but it's also um, a very dark place. So I felt called to write this book um, as a woman of color, first of all, to, I, I don't know how to, what the opposite would be of a race, but first of all, well, to tell the truth about what our history is. And I think it's very important that it's told from our perspective. Throughout my book, I, I talk about how the African-American people in my book felt what they thought because I was able to find those things from my research. I'm not sure that someone who is not a person of color would understand that experience enough to be able to write what I wrote. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, Yes, Andrea, I did just share to you in a private chat three questions about UNC. Trying to I also shared some, yeah, private questions. Um, uh, there are so many things in the chat. Please read there, them because I'm not seeing them. So, seems, Josie, then Nancy. Yeah, there seems to be quite a few questions just about UNC's reaction, I think, to your book and how that's um, impacted your relationship there, your position there. Have you felt, here's one of the questions, have you felt pushback from UNC in regards to the sharing, to sharing the work with students in their classrooms now? Um, yeah, a lot of questions like that. Well, let me answer that question this way. I am surprised, shocked, that I have not gotten a call from the chancellor asking to meet with me asking, how do we go forward? You've, you've uncovered all of this history. What do you think we need to do to go forward? Now, I have gotten some feedback from a lot of the faculty that have been there for decades saying they didn't know this history and thanking me for writing this book. I don't, it, my book has only been out for two and a half months. So at this point, I, it's not being taught in classrooms. Um, although I understand that part of my book was read um, in a Department of Education course, the professor read it out loud. Um, so I'm surprised and shocked. But then on the other hand, I, I should tell myself that I should not have expected anything more from my university which by the way, I love even more after writing this book. Why, you may be asking. In fact, I'm wearing Carolina blue earrings tonight. Um, I love this university more because after learning the history and learning all of the contributions that people of color have made to that university, Native American people and African American people have made to that university, that university belongs to people of color. And I have been encouraging students, you know, not to, not to walk away. It was literally built brick by brick by enslaved people who made the bricks, by the way. So I hope I've answered your question. 
Here's um, an action question. How can we organize the people that are here tonight, the people that are going to watch the video? Um, how can we show up at school board meetings like Moms for Liberty, which has a chapter right here in Orange County? Time is passing and we are letting this happen without an effective response. Well, my law professor who trained me in critical race theory would always tell us this, you know, most of it is showing up. Most of it means you need to go to the school board meetings and challenge the people that are there. And you need to find out which social justice organizations are in your area. For example, Reverend Barber is now um, in charge of the Poor People's Campaign, um, which is across the nation. So, you know, we can't just sit back idly and watch um, the First Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment be eroded because soon we won't recognize this nation. We are already at that moment, I think, where we don't recognize this country, right? I mean, we have got to wake up and we have got to not just wake up, but we have got to get organized and start pushing back on these issues. There are many schools that have black history in the curriculum. How do these new laws jive with what is already in the curriculum? Is black history um, in education now prohibited? If, if, the, if the black history is divisive or if it, caused, if it could cause a white child to feel guilty, then in the 27 states that have introduced bills or other measures to restrict how American history is taught, it, it will not be taught. But again, it, you know, I, it, it's a case by case basis. You'd have to pull up what the proposed law is in your state to actually know what would be banned. One of the things that um, I did was I used our new legislative tracking tool to take a look very quickly, a quick glance at what has been introduced across the country. And it, there really and truly are a number of laws that have been introduced in some surprising states. Mm -hmm. um, another, going a little deeper into one of the previous questions, what is the best way to respond to complaints to local school boards from parents against teaching the truth of our history? Well, the parents who are against the teaching of American history were organized and holding up signs saying, you know, ban critical race theory. So if they can get organized around a lie, certainly we can get organized around the truth, right? So it means that you have to find the people that um, you know, are, are, willing, are willing to take a stand and are willing to fight against this. And the people who have the, the same opinion as you do. Now, if the Thank question you. is how to organize, you'd have to talk to my um, talk to our friend Joel Siegel about how to organize. He's the expert, right, Andrea? Uh, uh, yes, and I think there's also the question on language and messaging. We've done su such an about face on messaging regarding the voting rights bills. So we no longer talk about voting rights. We now have changed our language to some degree and we talk about freedom to vote. So we really do need to have a strong, this is what our language messaging is to totally debunk the lie. And I think that's what people are looking for. So you need Joel and Rodney, we may be working on that for a while. Well, let me oh, just, let me, let me add, Christian. 
<laughs> let me let me add one one other thing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm forgetting the key example of organizing right here from North Carolina. You know, during the Moral Monday movement, um, a group of clergy and other people decided that they were going to push back against the restrictive laws that we were being passed by the conservative legislature. The, con the conservatives had, had power over the legislature, over the court, over the North Carolina Supreme Court, and over the governorship. And they decided that they were going to get organized and they were going to push back. It started with 12 people. At the end of the movement, over a thousand people had gotten arrested. So, you know, start small and you'll be amazed at how people will swarm to you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, Andrea, did you see the question that says looking at the Virginia election, what messaging would have been useful to counteract the gaslighting around critical race theory in Virginia? Two words, American history. I like that, I like that. And again, very, very straight, simple, nothing complicated. Um, and then we've got another question. How many black or people of color are on the UNC Board of Trustees? Why the failure for diversity on the Board of Trustees? Well, let me say this, even when the Board of Trustees has been controlled by Democrats who are purportedly liberal and progressive, the Board of Trustees have engaged in racist acts. There are, there are a few black people who are on the board. You have to understand how people get on the board. Members of the Board of Trustees are appointed by the legislature which in my opinion is a conflict of interest, but they are the ones who select who's going to be on the board of trustees. Right now it's a Republican dominated board of trustees, but during the Sonia Haynes Stone controversy, that was a democratic board of trustees. So the issue is when we look at the board of trustees is really not race, it's class. It's rich white men who no matter what their party is, want to and do oppress black people. And not just at the university, um, you know, and that's another point I want people to take away from my book is that as the nation's first public university, the University of North Carolina is revered and respected and often looked up to. So the things that have happened at the university have affected the state and the nation. Christian, I have a question for you. How is now coalescing with other social justice activist organizations to pass voting rights, the Equal Rights Amendment, immigration, criminal justice, and gun safety reforms, separate activism on these issues is not working? Well, we are part of multiple like huge coalitions um, that are working with like to really work on these issues. So we're part of like DFAC coalition. We're part of um, quite a few voting rights coalitions that are addressing these issues like as a large issue that are working toward voting rights, um, racial justice. We're part of a national abortion access campaign. So we're constantly working all together with over like 200 different coalition members to have a huge uh, like in solidarity, like unified strategy to try to work toward these issues together. Because we understand like now can't do it alone. <laughs> you know, we have to work in coalitions so we're all having the same messaging, the same strategy to work toward addressing these things. And from doing these actions, we were doing some actions on voting rights. And recently because of the actions we've been doing with coalition partners it's actually shifted President Biden's uh, viewpoint on the filibuster and now it's moving forward with some decisions that are making, and it's kind of been really shifting these actions have really made some shifts. So we're continuing to work forward with our coalition partners and all these issues and it's making some changes and we have to continue to do that. 
just as Gita's been making, you know, saying we have to organize, we have to be strategic, we have to get out there in front and continue to work together in coalition. Um, and then other sides, you know, working coalition with Joel all the time in different, different programs as well. So it's just coalition work it has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, another question for you, Gita. Have you received support from other folks at DNC, I'm sorry, UNC, that was surprising to you? Well, I think I, I think I mentioned this earlier that, you know, um, that a number of academic professors had reached out to me and said that they read my book um, and it was profound to them because they didn't know this history. Now, the entire time I wrote my book, um, very few people knew I was writing my book, but I would always say, I'm not writing this book for academics, I'm writing this book for the average person to be able to read and ex access this history that has so long been hidden and been erased. Well, I, I was very shocked, still am, that a number of academics have reached out to me and said that, um, that my book has worth and the story, the stories have worth. There's um, a note that I'm reading here in the chat and it says the inscription, let him rest here until he is ready to work again, will remain with me forever as I move forward in the movement for truth and equity. So I just wanted you to hear that comment. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, we need to drop in where people can buy the book again. Some people arrived late after we had already added the link. Oh, we have another interesting remark. Critical truth theory. I like oh, that one. Yes, that I, I like that too. Critical truth theory. That's very creative. Whoever made that up. We need you to be uh, our, the head of our messaging. Uh, all right. Hey, Jacqueline, way to go. Critical truth theory. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. All righty. Excellent. Um, Gita, do you have any plans to make your book available as an ebook? People want to know. Yes, it's available as an ebook on Amazon. But if you buy, buy it directly from the publisher, you can only get it in hard copy form and you do get a discount. Um, from tonight's event of 10% off. But it is available on Amazon and the Kindle. And what we'll do is now remember, there are going to be four people who have RSVP'd for this, who will be getting their own copy of the book. So I will be downloading the full list of everybody that registered. I'm going to dump it into Excel and then we're going to have Excel do a count where it just keeps repeating one, two, three, four over and over and over again. And then we'll find the first four people that end up with fours and the list will be in randomized order. So we will notify you by email if you are a lucky winner. Uh, we've got time maybe for one more question. Since Texas and California determine what will be in school textbooks around the country, what can be done to prevent uh, the potential impact on textbooks by, of course, the state of Texas? Um, <laughs> wow, that's a complicated question. Um, well, first of all, it's problematic that one state dictates what's going to be in all the textbooks across the nation, um, and that it's a conservative state um, is, is even more problematic. Um, but I, I, I really, I don't have an answer to that. Christian, do you, can you think of an answer on how we fight back against Texas? 
Well, I, I, my answer is always the same when it comes to things like Texas, is that it's so important that we get on a local level and we get into the schools, you know, the city councils, you know, getting elected officials and, you know, um, at the, you know, school boards, you know, state legislator, city councils, that is the way that's the best way to do it because those are the levels that sometimes they're the ones that are having the biggest impact and how what you're teaching to your students, to your students, what your what city ordinances you're passing, what legislature is happening at sea levels. So we want to train up, you know, I say training up feminist candidates, training up candidates who have our agenda, who are pressing forth that our value systems are the most important. So we have to get there at the local, regional, state level. Um, so that we train those people, put them in a position who are going to value and push forth our agenda, um, and also train campaign operatives who have our values in place too, who are going to also put those in place. That makes a difference. We can't always look at the federal level. We have to start locally. So as we do that, and we're putting you know school board candidates in place who are going to be passing those things, what the curriculum is being passed in the classroom, they believe that teaching American history is important. They believe teaching reproductive history is important. City council, they believe in passing ordinances that are protecting our people are important. And then we go further in the state legislature, we're making sure they're not passing out these voter restriction laws, continuing on and on and on. And we have to put organizers out, they're gonna get out the word and get out the vote and do these things in our communities. That's how we have to do it. Grassroots, every uh, single yes. time. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yes. that's my answer. Yes. All right, and then I'm going to take one more question. How can we use Executive Order 14050, which highlights Black education? I'm not uh, sure. Could the person give some more context to what they're talking about, Executive Order, to exactly what that number is about? I mean, the number of that Executive Order. I'm not familiar with the executive orders by number. I wish we, I were that smart, but I'm not. <laughs> can we only see rounds? That was his question. Yeah. Someone is asking, what is the discount code to use to order it from the publisher? When you order the book right now, there it, it this is the the discount is in effect just by ordering the book right now. So don't well, no, worry no, about no, they have to. No, there is no. Oh, no, no, Andrea, they ha actually have to enter the oh. discount code now ten at checkout. Now ten at checkout. All right, I just dropped that in the chat. Sorry about that. Don't mean no. To give that's you okay wrong information and it is in That's the okay. chat and everyone that is here in this room there is uh there are a lot of phenomenal questions in the chat we do allow you to save the chat so if you are in chat at the bottom of chat there are three buttons and they say more when you click on those three buttons the very first item is save chat and when you save the chat it will save it locally on your computer so um, as hard as it is to believe, we are coming to the end of our time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Rodney Sadler to unmute and I'm going to add him to the spotlight. And Reverend Sadler, if you would be good enough to close us out, sir. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Andrea, for uh, your hosting this wonderful event tonight. And uh, you always do such a fabulous job. Your questioning and answers uh, and bringing up the things from the audience was wonderful. Appreciate that. Uh, Christian, you were amazing. What a wonderful uh, inquirer you were, uh, engagement par uh, partner in the midst of this conversation. I really appreciated what you had to say and then how you brought it back to the issues of women's rights uh, in America. Uh, and uh, Tony Gita Kapoor, you are 
an absolute font of wisdom and information. I almost feel guilty being on here with these three brilliant sisters and uh, interrupting the flow here, uh, but this was uh, an amazing conversation. As we listened tonight, we heard everything from uh, the way that race has been used historically to disadvantage black and brown people, the reasons that it provided advantage to some people within the larger system. And I think that the way that you utilize the history of UNC Chapel Hill in a particular way gave us a, the ability to see in a, con, a particular context, the way that this continues to uh, shape and influence people's lives, the way that it uh, manipulated the history in a way that favored some over others, uh, and let us know that this is still a clear and present issue. Uh, as you talked about critical race theory, one of the things that stood out to me was that the way that this concept is used today in our public discourse is uh, in a way that is intended to be used as propaganda. It's used to say that uh, we should not have to tell the truth because the truth might uh, influence or negatively influence or hurt people's access to wealth, power, and privilege. It's for this reason that we have to uh, look at this. And I love that, that uh, comment that came from the audience. We need to talk about critical truth theory. I think that's exactly right. Critical truth theory is what you've been talking about all night, real American history and moving on with that kind of uh, American history. Please forgive me. I think I'm making a casserole and I think it's ready right now. Uh, so you have to forgive me for that. Uh, so, uh, but let me say this, as we close out tonight, one of the things that comes through more clearly than anything else is that we've got to do something about race. We've got to do something about race right now. Uh, we can no longer wait for the next great hero to come up and uh, change the situation for us. We've got to do something about race. We can no longer wait for time to just erode this, uh, this idea that has taken root in the American psyche. We've got to do something about race. We can no longer Think about uh, that at some point in time, we will truly live into these American ideals. No, we will never be the America that we were promised unless we today do something about race. It's time for us to stand up and step out and to do something. What do we have to do, Dr. Sattler? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing that we have to do is we all need to become educated. We need to know what race is, the way that it's worked. We need that true American history or critical truth theory taught to us all. Uh, there's so many different books out there today, so many different authors. Uh, Attorney Kapoor's book, I highly recommend this. Do a study group on to drink from the well in your congregation, uh, in your community, uh, with your social action group, uh, dealing with all sorts of issues. You can engage this text and learn a great deal. But then read other texts, uh, texts like Cast by Isabella Wilkerson, uh, texts like um, uh, text by uh, Michelle Alexander, by Brian Stevenson, by uh, Jamar Tisby, uh, by so many others who are delving deeply into race. Even white people are doing incredible jobs like Tim Wise at exploring what race is and the privilege associated with race in our context. We've got to begin to learn about what's going on so that we can confront what's going on. The other thing that we have to do is once we know something about what's going on racially, we've got to begin to act. Well, how do I act? Well, I'm glad you asked. Join the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, join the Center for Common uh, Ground. Join uh, now. Join these wonderful organizations that are trying to be uh, intersectional in their work and find ways past race and racial divisions. It's time for us to step up and step out in a new way. We will not have the kind of society that we want until we begin to do the kind of work that's necessary. In fact, let me just end by saying this. We say as Americans that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all human beings are created equal. Well, as long as race continues to shape our psyches, it tells us that we aren't equal, that we are unequal, that we are hierarchically related, that some are better, some are worse, some are fit to live in ghettos and go to underprivileged uh, schools and suffer without jobs. Uh, some are intended to go to great schools, live in great communities and have all access to wealth, power and privilege. We know that this is wrong. Race is a sin, and it's time that we came together and overcame it. So I just want to say, all of you tonight, you've got a charge. It's time for each and every one of you to get busy and do something. None of us, none of us here tonight, none of us uh, in our country today are guilty for creating the system, but each and every one of us is responsible to do something about it. Let's get started right now. Thank you all for joining us for this wonderful conversation. God bless you all. Uh, Attorney Kapoor, 
uh, Christian Nunez, uh, Andrea Miller, Joel Siegel. Thank you all for all that you did to put this great night together. God bless. Thank you very, very much. We are off Facebook.